Hello, hello everybody. Uh, today we're going to wrap up our discussion on reconstruction. This is reconstruction part two, the effects of reconstruction and, um, and the direction of reconstruction. So today we are going to analyze the influence of reconstruction policies on Northerners, Southerners, and on African Americans, which corresponds with key concept uh, 5.3 in and around there. Um, moving along. So let's start talking about uh, African Americans. Of course, a big chunk of the reason why the Civil War was fought and, uh, and many of the guiding ideas that were kind of pushing uh, uh, reconstruction from the, from the point of view of the presidents or from the point of view of the, uh, of the Republicans in Congress was the plight of African Americans. And, um, and the reality is, is that uh, freedom was not an easy transition for African Americans, but it was one that they embraced wholeheartedly. Um, and there was a tremendous amount of, uh, of animosity with, from the point of view of white Southerners who are now no longer getting the kind of deferential treatment that they were getting from their, uh, from their former slaves. Um, and this is, there, there's going to be a huge backlash on that. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But, um, but the, uh, the consequences of emancipation uh, weren't necessarily quite as liberating as we would like to think. Um, uh, now, for the most part, um, African Americans were, of course, free to leave. One of the first ways of exercising emancipation is movement uh, to get away. And there were an awful lot of African Americans who left their homes, um, of course, left their plantations, and uh, ended up living in cities or living in outside towns. Many of uh, African American males uh, joined the military. And quite a few of them actually just went west to find the same opportunities that uh, whites and immigrants had uh, gone out west. In fact, uh, something like two-thirds, I'm sorry, something like a third of uh, the cowboys who participated in the long drives out west that we'll talk about later on were um, black. Of course, we have an iconic uh, idea of, uh, of the cowboy uh, from the west, but in fact, um, a large percentage of, uh, of cowboys were black. Um, However, an awful lot of African Americans, in fact, many, many African Americans, ended up staying right where they were. Um, so, uh, I mean, we could take a look at this uh, at this image here, which is a, an image from uh, a particular plantation. I believe this is called the Barrow Barrow Train. Um, Plantation, and um, and here you kind of see what it looked like in in the 1860s. Of course, there's the master's house and the the slave quarters are right here. Um, but now, what ends up happening is in 1881, what we've done is well, we we no longer have the slave houses and that kind of thing. But many of the folks who were part of this plantation ended up just kind of settling right back into the uh, the plantation lands. Um, family. Many uh, now remember during this during the time, slavery times, um, people could be bought and sold, and and uh, white uh, plantation owners did not recognize the validity of black marriages. So families were split up, children were sold off, and many of the uh, African Americans now freed. Among the first things that they were going to do is they were going to go off and they were going to try to find their lost loved ones. Of course, which is what many of us would do. Um, also, too, for the very first time in African American history, uh, marriages that took place between uh, uh, among former slaves are now going to be recognized. Uh, you know, African Americans are going to go to the courthouses and get their slave marriages, which were unofficial marriages, recognized. Um, gender roles: uh, African Americans have largely been uh, indoctrinated into American uh, gender values, and for the most part, they're going to hold to that um, with a, a male-dominated. Um, family life, uh, a, a father, a figure who is going to do the, uh, the, um, the instrumental roles, going out, working, earning a living, uh, and the, uh, the, the female uh, in the family is going to do the domestic chores. Of course, when you're poor, uh, many of those gender roles don't quite work out for you. You have to use what you have, and there were many instances in which uh, both men and women of course, we're working in the fields or uh, doing the instrumental tasks to try to earn money in order to support the family. Um, religion, this is the, actually is black churches are going to be among the very first um, black controlled institutions. Uh, and black churches were going to rise, in the, especially in the South. Um, and oftentimes you would have white denominations and then black denominations, right, you know, uh, relatively nearby. 
and the black churches are going to become the centerpiece of uh, the developing black communities that were, were you know, rising up during this time. You're no longer living on the plantation. Um, and many of the plant, uh, black communities, uh, you know, free blacks, ended up living together, either through choice or so oftentimes by, um, you know, by, I don't want to say force, but uh, strongly encouraged by the white communities to, uh, to live in those areas. Um, in schools, the uh, African American community at this time is going to see the tremendous value and necessity of education in schools, uh, but didn't necessarily have the resources. Now, the Freeman's Bureau, a federal program, at least for a short time, is going to come into the South and help to set up schools and, and, uh, and institute literacy and, and uh, numeracy and that kind of thing. Um, but for the most part, the African American community was on its own in, in, uh, in forming schools. Uh, at least at first. Uh, oftentimes these schools were going to be formed by, uh, by churches, but also there were many of what were called wayside schools at this time, which was anywhere you could find a teacher and you could sit down with students, you had a school, uh, whether that was in the back of a, uh, uh, a, a, a horse-drawn buggy or uh, wherever, uh, in somebody's home, um, wherever you could conduct school, you conducted. But, the, but to learn to read and to learn to, and to learn um, mathematics and to get an education, especially in history and, and, um, and literacy. These were very, very important to the African-American community and African-Americans in general, many of whom we have to remember had been denied this opportunity to read. In, in, in some cases, it was illegal for African-Americans to learn how to read. Um, so school and education became a centerpiece in the African-American community at this time. Um, unfortunately for the uh, African Americans, uh, in fact, many of them uh, who had actually already been given, uh, of course, uh, we, we learned about Sherman and his field order 15, and, um, and uh, uh, the idea of just taking the, um, the plantations and dividing them up into sections of land and giving that land over to, to uh, former slaves uh, didn't exactly work. Of course, uh, many Republicans were guaranteeing that you know, each African-American family would receive 40 acres and a mule in order to sustain himself. And well, that is pretty much going to be vetoed by Johnson and later vetoed by uh, uh, you know, Grant. Uh, and it's just simply not going to happen. Uh, and in fact, what's going to happen is the, uh, the systems that created this kind of a situation uh, plantation owners were restored, uh, were given their property back during the Johnson administration, but there was nobody to work these plantations, so plantation owners uh, offered um, opportunities for African Americans uh, who already knew how to work these fields. Uh, these are the guys you're going to have to hire, so they instituted a form of uh, what uh, a, an economic form called sharecropping, in which um, the um, African Americans would be allotted a certain uh, segment of the field, uh, and they would work those fields, and in return they would uh, they would get a a share of the crop to keep for themselves and for their own profit. The rest would go to the landowner. We also had a system of tenant farming in which uh, uh, farmers would rent land uh, and pay their um, pay their tenants uh, based on their uh, based on their their own uh, profits. So, um, so these situa this is this was the scenario, and you can kind of get a look here and, you can, and see in many cases uh, what the South looked like for African Americans before the Civil War wasn't all that different from what it looked like after the Civil War, and this is of course going to become a major uh, criticism of Reconstruction, the process of Reconstruction. Uh, now, African Americans at this time are going to gain experience in politics, and we're going to actually see Amer African American participation in politics at the national and at the state level. Um, <coughs> African Americans are going to emphasize, of course, equality before the law, making sure that they get the same rights uh, enforced on them as white people do, which, of course, is a brand new concept for them. Um, suffrage, the right to vote is going to be a centerpiece to uh, African American politics and also uh, land distribution. African Americans, of course, being completely disinherited, uh, um, I just lost the word, um, disinherited, I guess you might say, the property list for the most part, um, you know, once they're freed, no, they need to have something to, in which to build their, um, to build their lives on. The, the part of that has to do with land distribution. Um, and, uh, but for the most part, 
uh, African Americans are going to benefit from military reconstruction. We talked about um, the Republican government uh, in the North uh, just sending down soldiers to enforce these things. And, of course, um, it's going to happen. Uh, and, in fact, uh, African Americans in 1868, about 80% of the African American male population is actually going to vote in 1868. Compare that to election uh, polling data today, which you don't hardly get 80% of almost anybody uh, coming to vote today. But 80% of African Americans are going to vote in 1868. And it is, uh, it's going to be African Americans who are actually going to become a political force in the South, especially in, in those places where they are the numerical majority. Uh, we're going to start to see uh, black Republican governments um, you know, rise up at the local st and state level, and even uh, we're going to see the election of two national senators, Hiram Revels and Blanche K. Bruce, um, elected uh, from their respective states, uh, and also 14 congressmen are going to, 14 black congressmen are going to have, take their seats in Congress as a result of this. Um, the Union League was a, an organization that, w that was uh, founded in the South largely to support the development of Republican government, and their goal was to incorporate uh, African Americans into the political scene. Of course, this was seen as something to empower the Republican Party in the South against a pretty significant Democratic, um, you know, resistance. And um, unfortunately, um, this, this, the advances and the political advances made by African Americans during Reconstruction are not going to survive the Compromise of 1877. Once troops are withdrawn from the South, and once, um, once um, you know, federal policing policies are no longer put in, in, into effect in the South, uh, African Americans will be largely disenfranchised from the political and, and, and removed from the political process. Um, laws would. Um, are going to be put into place um, once uh, Democrats, Southern Democrats, start to take more of a uh, take more co control and more power at the national level and at the state level. Uh, they will institute what we we'll call black codes, and these black codes pretty much governed um, the lives of black people. And in many cases, these were simply just the old slave codes that that governed the conduct of slaves and determined where slaves could and could go, could and could not go, and how they had to act and how they were going to. Uh, to go about their business. Um, of course, we're going to add on top of that what blacks had to do in order to be able to exercise their franchise and to vote um, and, uh, and to participate in the marketplace. Um, oftentimes, these were simply just the old slave codes, and we just drew a line through the word slave, and we put the word black. Uh, and in many cases, they were very, very restrictive laws. Now, these are laws that are put into place. These are not just norms that, are, you know, that we just kind of understand that we need to follow. These are actual laws that were put into place uh, to govern the lives of black people. Um, now, from the point of view of the South, um, the South ended up, if you were a, uh, a citizen of these former Confederate states, you were very, very resentful about what was going on in your life. I mean, imagine, uh, as far as you were concerned, at least for four years, you were your own country, and now you have soldiers, northern soldiers, people who maybe your fam you or your family were fighting not too long ago, are telling you what to do and how to run your affairs. And this is going to create a great deal of bitterness and resentment on the part of Southern people. And, um, and the uh, Southerners are going to be in a constant state of conflict with their, uh, with their Republican governors, so, so to speak. Um, now, Republicans, for the most part, uh, had a bit of a coalition going on in some of these southern states, especially during military reconstruction, where their word was pretty much enforced by guns. Um, and first among these, of course, are African Americans. African Americans are not going to join the Democratic Party at this stage of the game. They are going to be very ardent uh, Republicans. They will vote Republican. In fact, we talked to you last week about how, or last um, last lecture about how was the African American vote that got uh, Ulysses Grant uh, into office his first time around. So, um, so um, uh, hold on. All right, had a bit of, a, of an interruption there. Uh, we also had, there were an awful lot of folks who were uh, Northern Republicans, or they were kind of riding the opportunities that, they, that the, these Republican governments were, uh, 
were offering in the South, uh, and these were known as carpetbaggers. So these were Northerners, uh, so-called carpetbaggers, because of uh, you know they were pictured as people carrying uh, what were called carpet bags, uh, suitcases made out of carpet material, and they were moving down into the South. Um, sometimes to take pol political positions and bureaucratic positions, other times to do uh, because they had networked in, and they were going to take advantage of business and investment opportunities in the South. Uh, some of these carpetbaggers were people who um, who legitimately believed in a, an opportunity to reform and restructure the South and, and help African Americans out. Um, but in many other cases, these were folks who were there to exploit and to take advantage of this, uh, the, this, this, this Republican domination of the South, forced domination of the South. Um, and probably the most reviled of the, uh, of the Republican coalition in the South were the Scalawags. Uh, the Scalawags were Southerners themselves who decided that it was in their best interest to, uh, to participate with the Republican government. Now these were typically maybe small farmers who felt that a Republican uh, you know, government it would be of more greater benefit. They were people who were resentful of the uh, large plantation owners. Uh, they may have been uh, poor, disabused whites. Um, who certainly didn't benefit from, uh, from democratic government um, before the Civil War, and now here was an opportunity for them to get ahead and for them to get uh, maybe even access to some resources that they never had before. So they're going to cooperate with the, um, with the Republican governments, but they were largely hated by their communities. And there's going to be a tremendous amount of resistance to this among Southern communities, um, most notably, a group of folks called the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan is going to rise uh, during Reconstruction, founded by uh, uh, so former Confederates, including uh, most famously General Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, Confederate General, uh, and, and among some others. Um, and they are, in essence, going to be almost kind of like the enforcement, or dare I say, terrorist arm of the Southern Democratic Party. Uh, during this time, and in fact, um, th they would oftentimes use brutality, uh, fear tactics, and just flat out outright violence um, to um, to support the uh, reestablishment of the Southern Democratic Party and uh, and the old power structures going on down in the South. Um, most famously was, of course, the Colfax Massacre of 1873. Uh, after a close election in Colfax Parish in Louisiana. Uh, a Republican government was elected, mo largely by the results of the majority black population, um, and uh, to keep the, uh, this Republican government from taking its seat, uh, Demo uh, Southern Democrats and um, uh, among members of the Ku Klux Klan and other uh, white supremacist groups, I guess you could say, uh, rushed onto the uh, to the seat, the county seat in Colfax, and um, literally attacked. The, uh, the, the government there, uh, the, uh, a largely black militia was called in to try to stop uh, these guys from doing it, but um, they were outgunned uh, for the most part, and in fact uh, the, uh, the Ku Klux Klan and their, uh, and their white uh, allies are going to kill over 100, and some case, uh, depending on who you read, uh, read 150 African Americans and their uh, Republican allies. Um, this is an image uh, from this time of the, uh, the massacre of, uh, of Colfax, uh, drawn during the time. There are no photographs that I, that I know of. Now, the North is going to respond uh, to these acts of violence and these acts of terrorism um, by passing the Enforcement Acts, which is going to uh, make the enforcement of, um, of civil rights in the South a, um, a federal obligation. So we're going to give, you know, we're going to send troops down into the South to stop any attempt to stop uh, African Americans from protecting this, uh, from practicing their civil rights. Uh, Ku Klux Klan Act is going to put uh, the Ku Klux Klan in federal jurisdiction so that it's the United States government that is going to take responsibility for, you know, kind of keeping down the Ku Klux Klan, which they do pretty effectively for a number of years. And, um, I'm sorry, and the Civil Rights Act, which is, uh, which is going to um, I'm sorry, the, 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 the Civil Rights Act, uh, which is going to make uh, civil rights a national federal issue, and the, the enforcement of civil rights is going to be a national issue of national uh, interest. So um, now, uh, during this time, though, uh, the tide is, of course, as we learned, uh, Northerners at this time, Republicans at this time, are going to just kind of get weary of, of trying to enforce 
um, you know, reconstruction in the face of such resistance. And ultimately, the old Democratic, uh, Southern Democratic uh, coalitions are going to come together and they're going to start reestablishing themselves uh, at the local level and then ultimately at the state and then ultimately at the national level. Uh, these governments, when these, uh, when the new, when the Democratic Party will take over from the Republican, uh, you know, established Republican governments in the South, these were known as your Redeemer governments. Uh, these were the governments that were going to bring us back to the good old days um, before uh, this this Republican invasion. Um, for the most part, the Southern economy. Um, not only did it continue to be dependent upon cotton, but it actually cotton dependency actually grew. After the Civil War, the price and the value of cotton increased. Uh, many southern farmers who uh, found themselves in debt uh, turned to growing cotton as a way of trying to get, uh, you know, trying to pay off, their, get enough money to pay off their debts. Uh, well, this counter backfired, I guess you could say, in that so many Southerners started to grow cotton that it actually reduced the value of the cotton, which meant that it became more difficult for these uh, for farmers to uh, to pay off their debts. Uh, these debts, in many cases, these debts, the uh, collateral of these debts was on their crops themselves. So these uh, these farmers, this was called the crop lien system. So the crop lien system, of course, encourages more cotton farming, which reduces the value of the cotton, which, of course, means that, um, that those liens are going to be called in. A lot of uh, southern farmers, especially small farmers, are going to lose their land entirely, and guess what? They're going to end up having to take up sharecropping. They're going to have to take up uh, tenant, uh, tenant farming. Um, in fact, by the, uh, by the end of Reconstruction, sharecropping and tenant farming is going to constitute about 40% of the farming in the South. Um, and in fact, about uh, one third of all white farmers are going to be sharecroppers and tenant farmers, uh, as well as three quarters of all black farmers during this time are going to be sharecroppers and tenant farmers. Uh, the one group, of course, that does manage to come out ahead on this one is going to be a, a rising merchant class in the South. Of course, they're the ones that hold the loans, right? Uh, the only, you know, the, remember, Confederate currency wasn't worth anything, so many, many times it was the merchants who were extending credit to the uh, Southern farmers in exchange for, for a percentage of their crops. Well, guess what? Uh, those crops are not going to return a percentage, so these merchants are going to, in essence, just take their land. Um, now, the North was also affected by Reconstruction and by the Civil War in general. So during this time of Reconstruction, uh, the United States is actually going to grow to be the world's second largest manufacturer, uh, second only to the United Kingdom, second only to Britain. Um, and uh, a lot of this had to do with the fact that the government uh, was subsidizing investments in infrastructure. It was kind of like almost, uh, kind of like uh, the, um, the old American system. Uh, remember, many of the, uh, the Republicans during this time were former Whigs that believed in this kind of American system investment in, um, you know, in industry and in manufacturing. So, uh, for instance, the Pacific Railway Act of 1862 was the largest federal subsidy in American history, larger than the New Deal, larger than anything that we've, uh, the, the federal highway system. Uh, it, was, it was absolutely huge. We'll talk, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in depth in the, in the next lecture. Uh, there was also a National Mil uh, Mineral Act, which allowed for federal subsidies of mining of uh, important metals uh, in order to, uh, to develop our, our industries and our infrastructure. So what we see here is, well, especially federal subsidies going to rail Railroads and railroads were a centerpiece of the northern economy at that time. Think about it. Uh, railroads, of course, expanded markets and made a, a you know and and, and, uh, and it increased demand uh, as products can now be sold uh, further away and can actually be brought in cheaper from further away. So we uh, we, we have a we have a double uh, whammy. But the fact that these railroads were uh, federally financed or federally funded, of course, is going to mean that banks are going to be more willing to fund these railroads. Um, and investors are actually going to be more willing to invest in these railroads and in anything connected to these railroads. So by funding these railroads, we're creating a boon for the bankers and we're creating a boon for Wall Street to invest, which of course leads to more construction of railroads, which of course means you're going to increase the demand for fuel. Um, uh, coal at first, but ultimately also oil. Uh, we also increased the demand for mining, especially for things like iron and chromium and, uh, and things along those lines in order to, to actually build these railroads and to construct the steel that goes into these railroads. Um, so all of these, uh, these industries are going to, uh, to grow as a result of, uh, of investment 
uh, started under uh, Abraham Lincoln, of course, and of course expanded under um, uh, Andrew Johnson. So, consequently, in the North, we're going to see the rise of a new corporate class, something that the United States had never seen before. And we're going to, again, talk a little bit more about this later on, but for now, uh, folks like Cornelius Vanderbilt controlled, uh, and Jay Gould, these guys controlled many of these, the railroads, the this, this central industry in the United States. John D. Rockefeller and his Standard Oil is going to provide the fuel uh, for these endeavors. Uh, Andrew Carnegie is uh, you know, going to become rich uh, in developing steel. So uh, we're going to talk about these guys in a little bit, but it wasn't all, uh, it wasn't all roses and cream, uh, so to speak. We do have in 1873 a major depression, probably the, uh, the most serious economic depression. Um, that was a result of overexpansion in these, uh, in these markets. Uh, and this will be the deepest recession that the United States had experienced during that time. Well, yeah, the wealthier your country gets, um, the more it's going to hurt when the, uh, when the depressions come, I guess you could say. So, um, so there we have the, uh, the North. Now, politics is also going to start to shift during, the, uh, during Reconstruction. Let's face it. Uh, what is there left for the radical Republicans to do, especially as people start to become fatigued with uh, the idea of this military reconstruction, all oh, and this radical reconstruction going on in the South. One, it's so painstaking, and two, it's really honking expensive, and one of the things that the Northern Democratic Party, who of course has to figure out what they stand for, is going to do is start hammering the Republicans for all the money that they're spending. Um, so the, the, the radical Republicans are going to start to fall by the wayside, and they're going to give to a more, um, a more conventional Republican Party led by, uh, you know, uh, Roscoe Conkling and uh, James Blaine and some of these other guys who we're going to talk about later on. There was, although briefly, a, uh, a group of liberal, what were called liberal Republicans. Now, when we say liberal Republicans, I don't want to mean liberal in the, uh, in the sense of these were folks who were, um, you know, out for changing society and creating equal, you know, equality and justice and kind of thing. Uh, by liberal Republicans, we mean that they, were, they emphasized liberal economics. Uh, in other words, they, they were emphasizing a return back to just good old-fashioned free market economics, uh, kind of the stuff that was promoted by the early Democratic Party, as opposed to the Whig idea of government intervention and government, uh, um, you know, in, in investment in industry. The uh, liberal Republicans are saying, oh, eh, we're spending too much money, we're getting out of control here. What we want to do is we want to lower taxes, we want to free the market, and, um, and kind of get the government to step back and just let business do what it needs to do. Um, the liberal Republicans were very weary of the idea of democracy. Of course, they're seeing large, no they're seeing large numbers of African Americans uh, you know, coming into the electorate, and they're thinking, whoa, wait a minute, that could create a black majority in the South. Uh, which could become a real problem for us. Uh, don't forget, just because the North was not, uh, it was against slavery, doesn't necessarily mean these guys weren't racist. Eh, almost everybody was pretty much racist at this point. Uh, they're also a little bit concerned about immigrants coming in in the East, creating their own electoral majorities, and uh, of course, Asians coming in in the West, creating their own electoral majorities. So democracy wasn't something that they really wanted to see happening. Um, and most importantly, they were pretty much just done with Reconstruction. Let's just get out of Reconstruction, put the Civil War behind us, and let's move on with what uh, the United States does best, uh, which is business. Um, and uh, these liberal Republicans became very, very popular among the middle class uh, and, and among businesses. I mean, you know, of course, the middle class, is gonna, uh, which is usually the one that carries the burden of most of the taxes historically, are going to like the idea of paying less taxes, which is, uh, you know, felt by the liberal Republicans. And, um, and businesses are going to like the idea of not having a government, uh, you know, telling them what to do, although they're not going to be so happy about losing, uh, you know, great funding. Uh, and investments, but you know th this idea of free market economics appeals to businesses, um, and um, and also the uh, the Republican Party at this point, as a result of the uh, the scandals of the Grant administration, are just going to be plagued by scandal and and uh, accusations of corruption and things along those lines. It's not going to work very well for them. So the liberals, uh, the liberals are are going to gain a foothold in the in the Republican Party, and we're going to start seeing the Republican Party shift. To more of a uh, of a pro business, um, more of um, of a free market um, 
position. In many cases, uh, you know, the position that was held, again, by Northern Democrats uh, before the Civil War. Also, we're going to see the Supreme Court is going to put in its two cents worth, and pretty much the result of that two cents worth is going to be the gutting of Reconstruction and the gutting of the civil rights, uh, of the federal I investment in civil rights in the South. For instance, the slaughterhouse cases, uh, which were brought to the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court, in essence, rules that, you know, well, this, this was a 14th Amendment case, um, slaughterhouses uh, had created a, a state, uh, uh, a local monopolies, and um, they were sued. And basically said, hey, you can't, you can't create a monopoly because that denies us our equal protection under the law uh, to, uh, for, our, for, right and, for life and property. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled in the slaughterhouse cases that uh, the, 14th, uh, you know, the 14th Amendment does not apply to state the state's rights to regulate what happens within the states. So it's kind of a state's rights argument that, that the 14th Amendment only applies to national issues, not to states' rights issues. Of course, this is not the intent of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment uh, was supposed to be a national uh, way to, uh, to prevent uh, exploitation, especially against against African Americans. Um, in fact, uh, the Supreme Court in some other cases, the Cruikshank case, the Reese case, is going to apply the 14th Amendment um, only to state discrimination. Um, as far as the Supreme Court was concerned, if you were an individual and you wanted to discriminate against whomever you wanted to discriminate, that was fine. If you didn't want to sell products to a person because of their color or what have you, you were within your rights to do so, that the 14th Amendment only applied to the state's desire to discriminate, um, which of course is going to weaken the 14th Amendment. Uh, the Supreme Court will also weaken the 15th Amendment by saying, uh, by mandating that the 15th Amendment only uh, does not guarantee the right to vote. It simply restricts the ways that we can discriminate against people. So we can't deny people the right, uh, their right to vote because of their color or their uh, sta status of previous servitude. But that doesn't mean we can't find other ways and other reasons to deny people the right to vote. So, uh, in many cases, because of this particular observation, many southern states are going to institute things like poll taxes, uh, you know, and, um, and other barriers to keep African Americans from voting, since they can. Uh, also, there was a series of uh, civil rights cases that were going to take place in 1883, sometime after... Uh, after Reconstruction, and these civil rights cases will simply overturn the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which was an attempt to uh, to rein in the Ku Klux Klan and rein in uh, these trespasses against African American rights. Uh, basically, uh, so the Civil Rights Act of 1875, I don't think I it described it very well, uh, made it illegal to discriminate against uh, people in public places like restaurants and, and, uh, and you know, things like that. So, um, so this, of course, overturns the Civil Rights Act of 1875. And um, now, the legacy of Reconstruction, I think, is, uh, is pretty well summed up in a, uh, a textbook that is, uh, that is oftentimes used in high schools, uh, written by historian David Kennedy called The American Pageant, in which he says, Many white Southerners regarded Reconstruction as a more grievous wound than the war itself. It left a festering scar that would take generations to heal, yet few rebellions have ended with the victors sitting down to a love fest with the vanquished. Given the explosiveness of the issues that had caused the war and the bitterness of the fighting, the wonder is that Reconstruction was not far harsher than it was. couple things. This is a secondary source. It is not written by somebody at the time. It is written based on the observations of a historian after the fact, which makes it a secondary source. Still a very valuable source. Also, I want to, uh, to bring your attention to this little... Uh, tidbit right here. Oops, let's do my, I forgot to do my little pen. Hold on. Um, oh, come on. That, that little three dots. That little three dots means that there is words missing in that section. There were words there that, and this, this quote kind of got a little lengthy. I took some words out. So you might want to go, hmm, what did Mr. Andosha leave out? And it may that be something that I need to know. Uh, so then you can go back to the source and you can go check and see that actually I've left out the dots and they, they, they don't really matter to the point that we're trying to make here. And the point that we're trying to make here is that ultimately, let's face it, Reconstruction was at least marginally successful. Um, <coughs> 
some of the po positive outcomes here is we were reconstructed. I mean, the United States did come together. The states were incorporated back into, the southern states were reincorporated back into the Union. Um, and, uh, number two, there has not been another civil war, you know, since, which is a pretty good thing, all right? Um, so, so, success. I mean, the states were reincorporated. We were reconstructed as a nation, so to speak. Um, African Americans during this time are also going to gain very valuable political experience that they're going to put into effect um, throughout the rest of history. Uh, and, you know, uh, even during times when it didn't look like African Americans were making very much headway politically, um, they were still networking and they were still building those, uh, those foundations and those institutions that would later successfully uh, create another, what some people call the second reconstruction uh, civil rights movement taking place in the 20th in the mid-20th century. Um, African American institutions were also founded. Uh, not just black churches, but black schools, black uh, universities and colleges. Um, and these are going to be invaluable to the, uh, to the improvement of the lives of African Americans uh, and to the improvement of the country as a whole. Uh, and is go they're going to be a centerpiece to later civil rights activities. Um, and another thing that I, I think uh, is oftentimes left out, but this is really the first time that we start to see a civil rights debate taking place in the United States. Yes, uh, there was a slavery, anti-slavery debate, but now we actually have a civil rights debate uh, about, about the role of the government in protecting the civil rights of citizens. Not just black citizens, but any citizens. And dare I even say, maybe women citizens. Uh, which of course will be presented, and we're going to, and the fact that we're having this debate at this point uh, is going to lead to progress in this area. Slow progress, punctuated progress, but progress nonetheless, and that is a result of, of, uh, of Reconstruction, I believe. Um, some negatives, of course, are presented, are as presented in this, uh, this um, cartoon, which is a primary source. Somebody at the time, a cartoonist by the name of Thomas Nast, in 1876, and this is called, Is This a Republican Form of Government? And you can see, oh, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Uh, and you can see, that he's really highlighting the plight of African Americans in, uh, in this place. Here we see the crumbled uh, school, uh, the fact that the, 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 uh, the white, um, you know, the white power is here, uh, and here's this guy who is clearly crying over his, uh, his dead family. In fact, I don't know if you can see this or not, this is actually a woman and her baby. Uh, so this is, this is very, very powerful um, imagery from this time. And the reality is that, uh, for one thing, we never accomplished uh, the, um, the, the kind of equality and toleration that is necessary uh, for society to be a truly democratic society uh, as a result of Reconstruction. Um, yes, we ended the slavery debate, but we did not end the debate with regard to, to civil rights, as we can probably see when we look, turn on the news and we see issues that still have to do with race and racism and intolerance. Um, and consequently, we also created an enduring bitterness between the northern states and the southern states that, yes, we never did get into a civil war, but this bitterness will continue uh, and still plays a role in politics to a certain point today. Um, and this bitterness continues on. And we also see, back in the idea of racism, we also see that, um, that as a result of Reconstruction, uh, we see groups like the Ku Klux Klan and other um, racist institutions actually fighting back against uh, the idea of democratic progress and, and egalitarian progress and entrenching themselves and institutionalizing themselves in our system and continue to be a presence uh, and a negative influence, in my opinion, on, uh, on American history. And this is, of course, something that comes out of Reconstruction. Um, so was Reconstruction success? Was it, uh, you know, uh, and to what extent was it a success? Well, that's up to you to decide for yourself. But take a look at this and, uh, and do your own analysis. And until next time, see you then.